Ladies and gentlemen, we will begin. Everybody can comfortably get a seat. Thanks so much. A good evening to all and welcome to our discussion of Peter Wallison's very timely, interesting, and important new book, Judicial Fortitude. I'm Alex Pollock of the R Street Institute, and here's the book in case you haven't bought one yet. I, uh, <laughs> I have the pleasure of reminding you that it is for sale tonight. As we think about the main question this book poses, how in the world are we as a society and as a government going to control the ever-increasing power of the administrative state or the unelected bureaucracy? If the bureaucracy assumes for itself what in fact are legislative powers, who or what uh, can restrain them? As uh, Peter writes, in many instances, administrative agencies appear to have issued rules or interpreted their authority in ways that exceeded the powers they were given by Congress, but the courts have not intervened. Should the courts be intervening to correct this overreach of bureaucratic will to power? Yes, says Peter, quoting Chief Justice John Roberts, it is the obligation of the judiciary not only to confine itself to its proper role, but to ensure that the other branches do as well. In other words, the judiciary is seen uh, in that quotation and in this book, as the keeper of the fundamental structure of checks and balances among the branches of the government. Now, the expansion of the administrative state got its original energy as one of the unfortunate results of the First World War and the American participation in it, with Woodrow Wilson's faith in the rule of experts, as Peter writes, the progressive faith in administrative agencies was anything but pragmatic, and uh, elsewhere he refers to this as an extravagant faith in administrative agencies. But it was a faith that was disappointed, and says Peter, it should come as no surprise that the administrative agencies were a disappointment to the progressives who had expected so much from them. It turned out that the administrators, even if experts, could not know enough to control whole industries, and indeed could not possibly know enough even in principle. You'd think the Congress could fix this, but Peter says that it can't and won't, and the record certainly supports Peter in this. Uh, and so the argument is that it's the courts that need to constrain Congress's own unconstitutional urge to avoid hard decisions by delegating them to unelected administrators. In other words, as the book says, it is essential to preserve the separation of powers by preserving the non-delegation doctrine, that there are things Congress cannot delegate. This would assure that only Congress will make the major governing decisions for the American people. Uh, thus, the deference that we all know about of the courts to the bureaucracies uh, under the Chevron rule would be corrected. It says, Peter, where the court believes that Congress has delegated an impermissible portion of its legislative authority to an administrative agency or to the president, it should not hesitate to invoke the non-delegation doctrine. Thus, the deference of the courts to the bureaucracies uh, would be replaced by fortitude in enforcing the constitutional order, and the deference in letting it be undermined would pass away. Our author, Peter Wallison, is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. While at AEI, he has published Ronald Reagan, The Power of Conviction and the Success of His Presidency, Nationalizing Mortgage Risk, The Growth of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Better Parties, Better Government, Hidden in Plain Sight, What Caused the World's Worst Financial Crisis and Why It Could Happen Again, and now, of course, Judicial Fortitude. 
Previously, Peter practiced law as a partner in Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, was counsel to Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, general counsel of the Treasury Department, and White House counsel for President Ronald Reagan. I had the great pleasure of having the office next door to his for 11 years at AEI and participating in his constant fount of policy analysis and ideas, not to mention wit. Peter will be interviewed by Adam White, who directs the C. Boyd and Gray Center for the Study of, of the Administrative State at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School, where he's assistant professor of law. Adam writes widely on the Constitution, the courts, and regulation. He serves on the Administrative Conference of the United States, a federal advisory body that proposes reforms for administrative agencies, and on the leadership councils for the administrative law sections of the American Bar Association and the Federalist Society. His recent publications include articles on executive orders and agency regulations and on ethics in the executive branch. The interview is going to run till about 545, after which we'll open the floor to your questions. At 6 o'clock, we will adjourn to a reception, including book sales and signing. We look forward to the discussion, and Adam, let's begin. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Alex, and thank you uh, all of you for joining us today, and thanks most of all for Peter for writing such a wonderful and bracing book. And it really begins with the very first sentence. If you'll, let me just quote the opening lines of the book. You say, it is not too much to say that we, are, that we risk losing our democracy unless we can gain control of the agencies of the administrative state. We risk losing our democracy. That's a pretty bold statement to open the book with. Please explain. Well, that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. Uh, because I am concerned that the trend that uh, has been developed here in the United States for many uh, decisions to be made by administrative agencies rather than by the Congress is a danger to our democracy. Uh, what I find in talking to people in the administrative uh, area, and especially among specialists in administrative law, is that they say, well, Congress is really not able to handle the complexities of the modern world, and therefore, we have to give much more authority to administrators uh, who will take the authorities that Congress gives them and uh, use them properly. The problem with that is that it doesn't pay enough attention to the fact that we live in a democracy and that it is the American people who are supposed to be making the major decisions. If we leave the decisions to the people who live in Washington, D.C., who are the officials of the various bureaucracies that uh, make up the administrative state, uh, then their priorities and their interests will be what the American people have to obey. And in a democracy, that's wrong. The danger of that, and there is a danger, and that is that the government could lose its legitimacy if this continues too long. What is legitimacy? Legitimacy is the authority that the government has, moral authority that the government has, to get its laws enforced. And people obey the laws voluntarily when they are voting for them, in a sense, by electing their representatives. But if people come to believe, over time, that what is really happening is that there's this unknown group in Washington who are making regulations that we all have to live with, and not things that we voted for, uh, or that Congress actually voted for, um, the problem is that people will begin to believe that they don't have to obey the law anymore. And actually, this, is, this has come to, bad, come to pass in Europe. You all know about Brexit, and that is the exit of Britain from the EU. If you read why that occurred, what you learn is that in many ways, the British people were very angry about the fact that they were subject to regulations that were being made in the EU over which they seemed to have no control, but which were imposed on them. Um, and so their vote 
and they were given the opportunity to vote, was to leave Brexit. The danger is that in the United States, something like that can happen. And if we look at what happened in 2016 with the election of, of Donald Trump, it's been called a populist uprising. And I would think it was a populist uprising. But was it really just people who were interested in conservative ideas of government? I think, in part, it might have been people who were very upset about the fact that the regulations and the rules that were coming out of Washington were foreign to them and unknown. They, un, they were unaware and unable to discern why these rules were being made. And I would mention one more thing, and that is that over the last 25 years, every year in those 25 years, the government has issued over 3,000 rules and regulations. It's over 101,000 rules and regulations in 25 years. Now, we all know that administrative agencies are supposed to fill in the details of what Congress adopts as a statute. But the number of statutes that have been adopted over that period of time is minuscule compared to the number of rules and regulations. So you can understand why the American people are beginning to be a little bit worried about what is happening to their government. So I wanted to start the book with just that idea, because everyone writes about administrative law in terms of the actual laws involved, the cases that are involved. But what is really the issue, to me, is whether the American people can have confidence that they are, in fact, operating their own government. Right. So in the long run, the key to legitimacy is returning more of these policy decisions back to Congress, back to the states and local government. But the title of your book is Judicial Fortitude. And the key to your book, as Alex explained in his introduction, is that we need the courts to play a greater role than they've played traditionally or recently in returning many of these issues back to Congress. And so let's just begin with the title of the book, Judicial Fortitude. Where did you get that from? I got that from Alexander Hamilton's Federalist 78. Well, that's a good place to start. Which, which is a wonderful piece of work in many, many ways. I mean, it's not only what I'm going to talk about, but he covers the whole purpose of what, of what the judiciary is supposed to be doing. Um, and in 78, what uh, Hamilton said was that, first of all, he was the reason he wrote the, apparently the reason that he wrote the Federalist 78 was because the founders, the framers, were getting asked by the people, logically, wait a minute, this is a democracy, and we're supposed to elect the government, but you're giving lifetime appointments to these judges. What, what, how does that make any sense? And I think uh, Hamilton's response was, we need the judges because they need, we need the judges to have lifetime appointments because that will enable them to stand up to the elected branches, the president and Congress. And what did he mean by stand up to? The, it's very interesting what the framers did. Not only did they set up, which I assume we will talk about at some point, a tripartite system of a legislature, an executive, and a judiciary, but they also interwove the actions of each of them, uh, which are called checks and balances. In addition to having the, the, the separation of powers, there are checks and balances. So the president participates a little in legislation with his veto. Uh, the, the Congress can, uh, can appropriate funds for the, the judiciary and for the president. And so these, these things were set up by the framers to make sure that no one part of their tripart system got more power than it deserved or, or was entitled to under the Constitution. So they established a Constitution in which the executive had enforcement powers, but they were very clear in Article I to say that only the Congress is vested with the legislative authority. And so the, the, I, the reason for this, 
was the lodestar that they always had in mind was simple, and that is the people's liberty. And they were accustomed to a world in the late 1700s in which the king could have both the enforcement authority and the legislative authority. And they, know, they knew and saw that this caused the loss of liberties for people. So by saying only Congress could establish the, uh, could make the laws, they were hoping that in that case they would prevent a powerful executive from being able to take away people's liberties. So here's Alexander Hamilton, and he's trying to justify to people why uh, we needed uh, judges to have a lifetime appointments, and he says that will give them the fortitude uh, to be able to stand up to the Congress and to the executive uh, when they try, because of pressures from the community or political pressures of any kind, to disassemble or change or eliminate the separation of powers. After all, the Constitution is only a parchment. It is, it, it's not self-enforcing unless someone enforces it. And so my view, and I'm not sure I've ever seen this in any other writings, my view is that the framers actually expected that the judiciary would stand up for the separation of powers and make sure that it never gets changed in any material respect. And that's what the book is about, because it says that the judiciary should step in and make sure that the powers, the legislative powers, don't get delegated eventually to uh, the administrative agencies, which are part of the executive branch. Right. And, and Hamilton is such an interesting thinker on this because he didn't just write about the judiciary. Right? Just a few papers earlier in The Federalist, he's writing about executive power. And he writes at one point that energy in the executive is a leading character of good government, including for the steady administration of laws. And so there's it's an interesting question about where Hamilton draws the line, what's the court's role. And there are parts of Federal 78 where he seems kind of deferential um, in terms of, of the courts construing laws to avoid constitutional conflicts. I'm just curious, taking a step back from Hamilton specifically, or if you talk about Hamilton all you like, it never gets old. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> um, at my program at the Mason Law School, we just named our student fellows the Hamilton Fellows because we thought, who better to name them after? Um, he was a bad shot, though, unfortunately. Well, that, well, he wasn't a quick shot. That was the problem. Um, but but with, how would you see the court's role? How would you describe well, judicial fortitude? But yes, what does that mean when it comes time for the court to review the constitutionality of an act of Congress? Well, the, what, the distinction I make in the book um, is that the courts, as I said before or indicated before, the courts have a very special, the judiciary has a very special responsibility for the structure of the government. When it comes to the words of the Constitution that constrain what Congress might do, that's completely different. And as a conservative, um, I, and a Scaliaite, so to speak, I have always been against judicial activism. There is no reason why the courts should impose their policy views on what the legislature is doing. But that is mostly under the, under the Constitution's authority to Congress and to some extent to the president to carry out the business of the government. Mm -hmm. That ought to have lots of latitude, as I think uh, Hamilton was suggesting. But when it comes to the structure of the government, the separation of powers, which is the central element of the Constitution itself, that's not something that is you can say, well, they should be deferential about. That is something I think that they were specifically assigned by the framers to pursue and ensure. So I make a, there's, there's no such thing in my mind for a ju judicial uh, restraint mm -hmm. when it comes to the issue of the separation of powers and the Constitution structure. Well, so getting beyond generalities and getting to the specifics of the book, you focus on a couple of aspects of judicial review, and one of them is judicial review of agency action. And, and you, you take aim at what the courts, uh, middle <coughs> scholars call Chevron deference, which just generally means uh, when courts are reviewing an act of an agency, 
they'll defer to the agency's interpretation of a statute as long as uh, the statute is ambiguous and the agency's interpretation is a reasonable one. And, and you criticize that approach in the book, or at least you ask the courts to recalibrate the way they go about deferring to agencies' interpretations. So why don't you explain? Well, it seems to me pretty obvious that if you have a judiciary, and if the judiciary is supposed to make sure that the Constitution is being observed, and the separation of powers is being observed, and that's the, the, the theory on which this whole thing proceeds, um, then it should be fairly clear that the judiciary should interpret the statutes. How much, legis how much power the Congress gave to the executive branch. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a statutory interpretation question. What Chevron did was say, direct, really, the lower courts not to do that, in effect, to say, well, these administrative agencies are experts. They're more expert than we are. Um, and if they interpret their statutory authorities in a certain way, uh, we ought to accept that if it's reasonable, right. as you suggested. But that doesn't strike me as reasonable in terms of what, what we are giving to the agencies. Because everyone, everyone should believe that no one should be the judge in his own case. And in the case of a regulatory agency or an administrative agency, if you're asking them whether they have the power to do something, of course they'll find a reason to have the power to do something. Right. It is the, the objective view of a court looking at that legislation, which is called judicial review, has a name, yeah. judicial review, um, that is sensible. Um, and then when you look at uh, the, the, the decision in, that, in the uh, Chevron case, you can see what it, that it became a, uh, an opportunity for the agencies to begin using statutes that had been passed years or generations before for new purposes yeah. that Congress probably never expected. And that's why from 1993, I just happened to choose that date because it happens to be one that someone has begun using to count the number of, of um, regulations. But by 1993, Chevron was, was actually adopted in 1984, but by 1993, the agencies had figured out that um, they had a lot of latitude here. Yeah. And so we began to get 3,000 regulations and rules each year until today. So it only makes sense to me if we want to keep this under control, if we want to continue to have a a country that is a democracy in which the people are actually voting for the rules, then we have to start reining in this power. And it came initially from the Chevron case. Yeah, now today Chevron has a lot of critics, especially on the, the right. Justice Thomas, to whom you dedicate the book, is one of the leading judicial critics of Chevron. Philip Hamburger has a book on administrative law. He wrote an article what you call Chevron bias, trying to re-characterize re what Chevron does. But of course, historically, going back to its origins, Chevron had a lot of proponents uh, among Republicans, including Justice Scalia, who was probably its most eloquent defender for a very long time. And, and if anything, Chevron arose um, as a reaction uh, to, by the, the Reagan administration of the Supreme Court, a reaction to the D.C. Circuit and other courts sort of micromanaging the agencies. And so obviously there's been a, a change in, 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 in conventional wisdom about Chevron. And I'm just curious, you know, what you make of that change? What, what, what brought that change about? Well, first of all, I, at least in my study, and it's not been comprehensive, but in my study of the conflicts between the courts and the administrative agencies have mo has mostly been about the adjudicative functions of the administrative agencies. The courts have been very unhappy about some of the ways that the agencies made decisions courts being lawyers and, and uh, uh, knowing something about how to be fair, mm -hmm. um, they have been micro, they did for a long time micromanage what the agencies did adjudicatively. I don't see the same thing happening on the rules side. And so um, from my point of view, that's where 
more attention should be paid. Now, um, why was Scalia such um, uh, an advocate? I know why Reagan was such an advocate of, of the Chevron case. Yeah. We'd have to go through it a little bit, but it, it, it opened up the environmental um, laws a little bit to enable a little bit more uh, latitude for companies that were trying to uh, uh, avoid having some of the costs associated with, with um, some of the environmental regulations. So Reagan liked that because that was one of the things that he was elected to do, he thought, and that is to reduce the regulations that were constraining the economy. Yeah. Someone else has done the same thing recently. Yeah, right. But, but um, in, when you get to the, the question of Scalia, yeah. uh, the only thing that I can say about that, and I am a fan of his, is that I've read some of the things he's written before he became right. a judge, right. let alone a justice, and in that he said he liked the idea of Chevron because it gave Congress um, a background right. on, on which to, with which to... I, perhaps you could explain that to me because that never made a great deal of sense to me. Yeah. I mean, he'd never filled it out to the point where I really understood what he meant by a stable background. Yeah. In any event, he gave up that idea toward the very end of his service on the court. Yeah. In the last case, I think, that really mm -hmm. came up um, that dealt with this, with this question of Chevron, he seemed to move toward where Justice, Chief Justice Roberts was yeah. on that. So um, I don't know whether that was something that would have continued over time, but he certainly seemed to see some value in a, a re, at least in reducing the impact of the Chevron case. Yeah. And we should add, while we're here at AEI of all places, right? When before Justice Scalia was a judge, he was a lowly think tank scholar here at AEI. As low as they uh, get. <laughs> um, <laughs> editing Regulation <laughs> magazine. Um, he, he edited the, the, the AEI's in-house magazine, uh, Regulation. I read it for the articles. And, um, and in that time in 81 and thereabouts, he wrote these really fascinating essays, which I commend to everybody, which are all available online, about sort of changing currents of administrative law then. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe that's why he started to change at the end, that maybe we were reaching another inflection point. But I mean, just one last question on Chevron. At the very least, the, 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 the generation that brought Chevron about, what they thought they were doing, in addition to Scalia saying it's a stable background principle against which Congress can legislate, they thought they were returning more policy discretion back to the mm -hmm. people, because the, at least the agencies are accountable to the president, unlike courts, and the president's accountable to the people. You know, they thought that they were making the administrative state, administrative law, more democratically legitimate. And I gather from the book that you think maybe that project failed, or, or, that, or that people decided, no, actually, this isn't legitimate. Oh, it's illegitimate, I think, for two reasons. One is yeah. the president has no way of controlling what the administrative agencies are doing. Yeah, there you stress that in the book. There are 3,000 regulations in a year, um, and they come out of all of the agencies over which the president has some kind of supervision. We're not talking about the independent agencies, like the SEC with a commission that is running it, but the Treasury is one of the major issuers of regulations every year, as is HHS and many others. And they are directly controlled by the president. But still, the president has very little authority directly over these things because the, the, the number is so great. And he doesn't have the staff, and the, and, and the OMB doesn't have the staff to review any but the very largest and most important regulations. So the, the whole uh, game continues to be played year after year uh, with these regulations coming out, and only a few of them actually reviewed by the president. But in addition, it's illegitimate for another reason, and that is that the president has no role of significance in lawmaking mm -hmm. except the, uh, the approval of the things that Congress approves. And to say, well, it's just as legitimate to have the president there because he's elected um, as to say nothing, really, because the president it, the mere fact that he is elected doesn't give him 
the authority under the Constitution yeah. to make a law. And so, really, um, this is what I call a fig leaf yeah. by people who want the administrative agencies to continue to have the authority they have. They turn to the president and they say, well, the president is elected and these people all work for the president, theoretically. And so it's not really a derogation of, of uh, democracy in any way for uh, Congress to give all this authority to the administrative agencies. But of course, it is a violation, simply, of the Constitution. Right. Well, the, and so the other defense of Chevron is that these statutes are written so broadly that you know, there's, it's hard to pin down a single meaning. And that brings us to the, the other major focus of your book, which is the way in which Congress goes about writing these statutes. And the question of, of when they write a statute, whether it's the Communications Act of 34, right, saying you know, the public interest standard or, or whatever, these statutes, they're not really legislating anything. They're just delegating power to the agencies. And so the court should enforce the non-delegation doctrine by sending these things back to Congress and telling Congress to do it over again. Is that, is that how you'd describe it? Well, that's, that's one way to do it. I mean, if we take the, the Chevron case, just yeah. that case in particular, what, what, could the, what could the court have done in that case? Mm -hmm. The first thing they could have done is looked at this question of whether um, a, uh, an, a single plant is the one that is the focus of the regulation, or whether it's a whole bubble that is all the plants associated with that plant um, that is belching forth, we'll assume, bad air, right. um, whether that bubble is what, is what Congress meant when it said that um, a, a source, a single source, um, should, be, should get a, a permit from yeah. the state in which it is operating. Well, that could actually be a detail. I mean, the, it was obvious what Congress wanted in the, in the Clean Air Act, and the court could have looked at this. The, the Court of Appeals, as a matter of fact, said that, that uh, increasing the, the scope from a single um, operation to a bubble of all operations together was uh, inconsistent with the statute and struck it down. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court took the case and said, well, they could have said, well, you don't have to strike it down because, in fact, it's just a detail. Whether it applies to this bubble of related agencies, entities, or whether it applies only to one, that's the sort of thing that an administrative agency can actually decide. That's one thing they could do. Right. Another thing would be to return it and say, it's really not clear what Congress intended here. Um, um, and, and a third thing would have been just to, uh, just to approve what the... Um, the uh, Court of Appeals had done and say, well, it was wrong. It, they were wrong under the, the statute was a clean air statute. And what you're doing is you are making it harder for the states involved to regulate. So they didn't do any of those things. They did the worst possible thing. And that is they said the courts should look at the, po first of all, they said the courts were actually delegated the authority to look at the policy here. Um, or uh, rather the administrative agency, is delegated the authority to look at the policy by, the, by Congress's silence. Because mm -hmm. Congress didn't say anything about this particular subject, the idea was that the agencies had that power. Um, that was a, an idea that makes no sense at all to me. But the second thing that they did that was, I think, wrong, was for them to say, um, if you... If you um, uh, are working on, on something like this, uh, you have the opportunity to uh, uh, decide, if you're a, a court, you have the opportunity to decide whether it's reasonable as a matter of policy. Now, how can a court decide whether something is reasonable as a matter of policy? A court can decide what the, what the Congress said, the significance of what Congress said, they can, they, can, they can tell to some degree what Congress intended, but to say wh whether the agency is doing something that is reasonable as a matter of policy brings the courts into exactly what we don't want, which is the courts to decide on policy. Right. So 
That's why I think it was wrong. Let's, right. let's and, talk about non de, non delegation. Right, and, and as you said, you know, about filling in details, so that's one way to look at the non delegation doctrine is drawing a line between the issues that are of such magnitude and scope that they really are legislative and Congress has to decide them, or issues where where, where the where the executive branch has just delegated the task of making a factual finding or filling in small details. I mean, how would you care? But there's other ways the Supreme Court's done this much more recently. Um, well, I mean, I guess the last century. Um, they've said, uh, they've said, <laughs> three recent. Well, relatively speaking, they've said, you know, there needs to at least be an intelligible principle. As long as there's an intelligible principle in the statute, yeah. that's good enough. What would your non delegation doctrine look like? I, frankly, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, what I do know is that an intelligible principle means nothing. Yeah. And it's in, infinitely malleable. And courts have used it that way. Um, uh, in fact, in one, one, in one decision, Scalia said that it came down to a single word, and a single word established what that intelligible principle was for an entire statute. Um, that's not workable. And so I think the courts have to have a jurisprudence of delegation, which they have avoided for 200 years. And they've avoided it because it is very, very hard. Right. Um, and, and it has many uh, consequences for them to do that. But the only time they've ever tried to do it, starting the jurisprudence, was in 1935, with two cases um, which, in which they found that delegation had occurred, and they struck it down. Right. After that, President Roosevelt had a, had a, uh, uh, a landslide victory in, in 1936 and tried to pack the court with seven additional justices that he would appoint. That kind of thing would never happen today. No, it would no. never. Uh, some people would be for it. Right, right, right. Yeah. But um, it, it would not happen, uh, I hope. But in any event, what happened then was the court was cowed. The yeah. court, actually, what court was, was faced with something that they never expected, and that is the president actually uh, retaliating against them and so they backed away. Right. And that was the last time since 1935 that the courts have ever tried to uh, determine what is a delegation of authority. I think, for the reasons that are laid out in this book, mm -hmm. that it, the court must begin to do that. And I do think now that under the, the co current composition of the court, I think there were five justices, including the last one who was confirmed a few weeks ago, um, who are willing to do that. Yeah. And um, Hamilton was correct. Uh, the, only the court can protect the separation of powers and prevent the continuous delegation of authority to the executive. And when you think about it, the more authority, more legislative authority the executive gets, the more discretion the executive agencies get, the more it is that they are making law, by almost by definition. And that's exactly the horror show, if I can put it that way, that the framers uh, were intending to prevent by the, the separation of powers in the Constitution. So I think this is an unavoidable question. Yeah. I mean, if we continue, if the courts continue to avoid it, if they continue to say this is too complicated for us, this is not something we want to get into, um, they don't have the fortitude, if you will, um, then we are going to have a situation in the future where most of the legislative authority of the United States has been transferred, delegated by Congress to the executive branch. And although we might all like what the executive branch does, that is all of us in this room, um, in each individual case, the American people have not done that. No. They have not approved it. And as a result, we risk the possibility, as I said at the beginning, that we will have a government that has, is out of control from their point of view and no longer, we are no longer a democratic republic. Yeah, it's interesting to see the current justices start to grapple with these issues. Again, Justice Thomas, to whom you dedicate the book, has been the leading voice on it. And he's been raising doubts on this issue for almost 20 years. Um, Judge Justice Gorsuch was writing about this when he was on the Tenth Circuit. 
But then two weeks ago, the Supreme Court heard a case called Gandhi. It involved the Sex Offenders Registration and Notification Act. And the, the issue was, did Congress violate the non-delegation doctrine by giving the Attorney General sort of broad power to decide whether to retroactively, retrospectively apply laws to people who have already been convicted of crimes? And the justices were really grappling with, well, first of all, what's, what's the intelligible principle? They were looking all through the statute, sort of like peeking <laughs> under a table, looking under a chair, looking for the intelligible principle, asking if maybe these, these various statements of purpose would add up to an intelligible principle. But, I mean, setting aside that one case, I mean, it's one thing to tell judges to have fortitude, but the judges, even with fortitude, have to decide how to draw a line. It's a very difficult. That's why Scalia, again, was so so wary of the non-delegation doctrine, not just on the court, but again, when he was here at AEI, he wrote, a case, he wrote an article about a case called the Benzene case, mm-hmm. where the justices started to grapple with this. Again, I know it's because I taught it two weeks ago. Um, um, but the thing is, he was right in a way that it's a very challenging line to draw. And so if you were to tell, if you, if you had two pieces of advice for the judges, one, the first would be have fortitude, right? But the second would be how to draw the line. And, and, and what would you tell them? Oh, I, I think this is the kind of thing that courts do over time, case by case. Yeah. Um, of, for example, when we're talking about Chevron, if the court had simply said, well, this is a detail, um, and it, no wonder Congress didn't deal with it. It's a detail. The agency can deal, would, can deal with something like this. Yeah. That would go down as one, one line in a series of cases that would produce what is called a jurisprudence mm-hmm. of delegation. Right. And it would go on for years and years, as the courts have done with, say, search and seizure, or with void for vagueness, which is another really good example right. of how they deal with things like this. Yeah. They do it case by case. And eventually, because of all these decisions adding up, you get finally a sense of what is a delegation and what is not. But it's the danger that the courts will actually say that this is a delegation that is important because the, the administrative agency knows that it can't go too far. And more important, Congress yeah. will then realize if the court strikes down one or two or three of the things that they have done to delegate authority to the agencies, Congress will have to start doing what they have failed to do uh, taking the course of least resistance on politically difficult things and delegating authority to agencies to make the decision. Um, they'll have to make the decision themselves. And why? Because the American people are made up of a whole series of groups and interests that want things done yeah. in the social area and in the economic area. And if they can't get it done at the agencies and they can't get it done at the courts, they will go to Congress and Congress will structure itself in such a way as to comply. And we will have legislation instead of having the Congress turn these things over to the agencies to do. Well, I think Alex is ready to undelegate my authority. I, I think he's. I am. <laughs> Consider yourself undelegated. I think that was a very good ending point we got right. to there. And thank you, Adam, and thank you, Peter, for a very uh, interesting discussion. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for you to be able to ask questions, uh, if you like. May I remind you, uh, when you get the microphone, I see we've got it, uh, please to tell us your name first and then your affiliation, and then ask your question. If you uh, you feel an urge to give a prefatory lecture to your question, please resist the urge uh, and come promptly to your question. And if you don't, I'll remind you to. I have... uh, First question, we'll start over here, uh, and then I think I have two and three, and then we'll see how we do in time. Um, Roman Bueller with the uh, Madison Coalition and the Regulation Freedom Amendment effort. My question is, the court majorities over tend to, to shift over time, and there's, I wonder what your thoughts are about the fact that, you know, we've got a majority now that probably would like to change Chevron, but we have a new president, we have new courts, they will want to go the other way. How do we protect, as, as you point out, the, the integrity of our democratic republic um, when half of the American political system wants to see more uh, executive branch authority? 
uh, don't we need something more than just a temporary court majority to, uh, to solve this problem? Well, I think my view of that is that um, judicial precedent uh, creates a lot of stability. And to the extent that the court begins the process of establishing a jurisprudence of non-delegation, if we can call it that, that process will inevitably just continue because lawyers will then bring cases on behalf of their clients, um, making the argument that the, the rule that they're complaining about has, uh, is an unconstitutional delegation. They'll get an answer to that from the courts, and that will create a lot of stability over time. So even though Congress will be controlled by one party or another party and the president the same, um, the Supreme Court's precedents will go on from year to year. They may be changed over a great deal of time, um, but as Justice, now Justice Kavanaugh said, uh, precedent uh, is important and might actually be controlled by the Constitution's language itself. Thank you. I have a question right here, please. Mary. Hi, I'm Elaine Middleman, I'm an attorney in private practice, and I'm sitting next to Judge Williams, who's very extremely distinguished member of the D.C. Circuit, so I have to honor him. Um, uh, he, I didn't come with him, I just happened to be sitting next to him. <laughs> 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 um, I like the term judicial fortitude, and I'm focusing now on the D.C. Circuit, not on Judge Williams. But it seems to me that there's an imbalance in the structure of how it operates because you have the Department of Justice, for the regulatory review cases, I'm talking about primarily agency review, you have the Justice Department attorneys on one side and you have random attorneys, public interest groups or whoever could be actual human beings on the other side. And I think that the court has a tendency, at least some of the judges, to honor what the representations are from the agency attorneys. And the agency attorneys it, view it as an, ad, this is my opinion, as an adversary system. So they don't go in front of the court and say, oh yeah, we definitely screwed that one up. <laughs> and so they're gonna defend whatever happened. And if, you're, if your focus is on making government run better, problem solving, then I think it would be very helpful if the Justice Department attorneys did say, you know, play some role in modifying or advising the court as to, yeah, this is a shortcoming, and that would give the court a better record. And the court seems to me to be so focused on the, folk, the perspective of the Justice Department attorneys, and then they have findings of mootness, standing, whatever. Okay, so at this they, point, I have to ask you to come to a question. If you that was my question. Phrase, okay. <laughs> but I, I think there's a structural imbalance. In uh, is the, there a structural imbalance between... To have judicial fortitude. Well, yeah, okay, thanks. I think there is a structural imbalance. Actually, um, I could have said that in response to uh, the Chevron question, um, because Chevron balances everything toward the government and toward the agencies. If you're a private attorney representing a client before a court um, and complaining about a rule, uh, it's very difficult for you to establish that the rule is unreasonable. Um, that, especially when the courts have been told that um, they should give deference to the agency. So there's that bias right there. Um, but some of the other points that you raise are good. I think the, the government maybe has uh, um, an obligation when it approaches the court to be a little bit more candid about um, their client's position than... Uh, the ordinary private lawyer might be, and so that's it's an interesting point of view, and it might be um, it might be something the uh, Justice Department might consider. Adam, I think you had a comment. Well, I just wanted to add. I mean, there's only so much Justice Department lawyers can do in the context of litigation. They they have clients, the the agencies, and they're duty bound to advocate for their clients. But the Justice Department historically has done so much more than just litigate, right? I mean, for a long time, the Justice Department played a central role in studying these issues of administrative law, writing reports. Some reports are still cited today. And I would just, in addition to everything Peter said, I would just add, it would be great if the Justice Department, in addition to what it's doing in litigation, would take a step back and start to resume the work 
of studying these things and looking at it systematically and criticizing some of these problems we're seeing in the context of reports, maybe that will help bolster Congress's energy in, in acting itself. Yeah, that's interesting. I actually, this reminds me of, a, of something that happened to me when I was at the Treasury Department because we had a, a major issue with the Treasury Department of regulation, won't even go into it, but, but um, I wanted to argue this case before the Court of Appeals. And um, before any general counsel of an agency can do that, you have to get the approval of the Solicitor General. So I went to the Justice Department, and the solicitor was sitting there with all these lawyers arrayed around him, and I'm making the argument. Now, this is one way that, in fact, uh, the Justice Department keeps bad arguments from getting up to the court, right? <laughs> I mean, so that's, that's an, somewhat of an answer to you, Elaine. Um, but uh, so I made my argument, explained why I wanted to make this argument, and the Solicitor General is listening to me, and when I'm finished, he looks it to the left, and he looks to the right, and he says, weak but not frivolous. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, I was able to go. I, I lost, but, but it, was, it was fun to do. That would be a good title for your next book, The Judiciary <laughs> Week But Not Frivolous. Thank you. I have the next question here, please. They have the microphone coming this way. Thank you. Uh, hi, Peter. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Dan Troy, formerly FDA chief counsel, former AEI, form, uh, outgoing general counsel of GlaxoSmithKline. Um, very quick aside, I do think there are times when the Justice Department pushes back on the position of agencies. Um, very geeky ad law question. I'm assuming if you're against Chevron deference, you're also against our or seminal rock deference, i.e. the idea that agencies get, um, get deference in the interpretation of their own regulations. Is there anything that you can say in addition about specifically that kind of deference on top of your critique of Chevron deference? Yeah, I think it's the same. It's really the same issue. And, and that is that our deference is that a, an agency is entitled, um, almost with, without any questioning from the courts, to reinterpret its own regulations. Um, and one of the things that came before the court that actually uh, Justice Scalia got a little concerned about was the fact that um, under the Administrative Procedures Act, the agency does not have to use notice and comment rulemaking process in order to modify one of its own um, regulations or uh, one of its own interpretations of its regulation rather than the regulation itself. Um, and he, he suddenly he's he seemed to think of himself, suddenly think to himself, well, this is odd. Um, the Administrative Procedure Act also seems to require judicial uh, review of regulations. And here we've gone on for years and years. This is Scalia talking. Mm -hmm. Here we've gone on for years and years saying that uh, agencies are entitled to deference and now, here's the Administrative Procedure Act that was adopted in 1946, and we've ignored it completely. And what it says is that judicial review is required. So that's one of the reasons that I thought Justice Scalia seemed to be moving away from the position that he'd held for so long on the question of, of Chevron. Thank you. Judge Williams? You wait to, for the uh, microphone, if you would. Uh, Steve Williams, I've already been identified as being on the DC circuit. Um, You've been unmasked. Is <laughs> this a question about your title, uh, judicial fortitude? Is that really the issue? Uh, because the Supreme Court has shown great fortitude on uh, gay rights, on abortion. Um, related sort of, quote, social issues. It hasn't shown fortitude on the issue that issues that you're particularly raising. So isn't it really its selectivity, its selective fortitude <laughs> that you're questioning? And do and you have an empirical explanation of that? Or, or do you question my premises? Well, here's, here's the way I would look at that, Your Honor. And, and that is that uh, 
Uh, the, the structure of the Constitution is so important and was given to the courts, in my view, by the framers that um, the fortitude that I'm talking about in the title refers to their support for the separation of powers. The other things that they did, of course, were very controversial that you mentioned and continue to be and will be for a long time. Um, but there you can actually argue about whether the court should have gotten into that area. I think in the question of the Constitution structure, the court must get into that area if we are going to have a system in which the, legis the laws are actually made by Congress. And if, and if the courts continue to hold themselves back from that, if the Supreme Court does not attempt to get into that area, over time, we will, we will have lost um, the whole structure of the Constitution where the laws are supposed to be made by the people um, who were elected by the public. Yes, sir. Um, yes, I think you could argue they've misplaced their fortitude. They might, they should not perhaps have done the other things, but they certainly have not done this one thing that is essential, I think, to the sustenance of, of our democracy. Thank you. With that, we have reached the end of our time. Uh, thanks for, again for a great discussion, Adam and Peter. Thank you, Adam. The book is for Thanks, sale, and Peter Excellent. will be glad to sign books and see you all at the reception. Okay, thank you.